you know, there's a there's a famous line in um, Shalom Aleichem's Tevye stories, or at the end of the, the chapter on Chava, when he's kind of he's broken down in tears because of his daughter who's converted out and he cannot visit her and he can no longer tell the story. The Shalom, the Tevye character is just weeping, weeping endlessly, and he says, you know, um, can we talk about something more pleasant? Can we talk about the cholera epidemic in Odessa? Um, and so today we're going to be talking about something much more pleasant, which is one of the most notorious fiascos in film history, Elaine May's Ishtar. Uh, and we will also be talking about Nora Ephron's debut feature, This Is My Life. I will introduce myself first, as long with the Talby Center for Jewish Studies. I am Eitan Kensky. I'm the Reinhardt Family Curator of Judaica and Hebraica here at Stanford Libraries. And today's program is co-sponsored by Stanford Libraries and the Talbot Center for Jewish Studies at Stanford. It is a series called Rewind, the Shenzhen Retrospective Film Series. It's a, this year's year-long topic is Jewish American women filmmakers. Um, just so happened that everyone turned out to be American. It was originally just Jewish women filmmakers, but that's perhaps a story for another time. Um, and I'm very excited today to be able to share the stage with the Associate Director of the Talby Center, Shana Hammerman. If you've been to previous events in this series, you know that I tend to take the lead in asking questions, but Shana has been inspired by This Is My Life and will be joining us. Shana is the uh, author of um, Silver, Silver Screen, Hasidic Jews, The Story of an Image on Hasidic Jews on Screen. And we're also joined today by our by Adam Naiman. He is a critic, lecturer, and author based in Toronto. He's a contributing editor to CinemaScope and writes on film for TheRinger.com. He's written several books on cinema, including It Doesn't Suck, Showgirls, and a series of director studies for Abrams on the Coen brothers, Paul Thomas Anderson, and this fall, David Fincher. So Adam, uh, why don't we start by having you tell us about these movies and introducing them you know, to our community? Sure, um, thank you so much for having me and for accommodating uh, the, the time difference. I'm speaking to you all from, from Toronto, so a little later in the day. Um, it's a very interesting pairing of films. And when I was approached to talk about them, I realized that there was an imbalance for me in terms of my familiarity because Ishtar is a movie I know very well. And hopefully by the end of this discussion, you guys will know well as well. It's a movie that I think a lot of people uh, have heard of without seeing. And actually it's director Elaine May famously said, if everyone who said they hated Ishtar had paid to see it, I'd be a wealthy woman, right? It's a movie that kind of became synonymous with, with badness, maybe not just uh, in opposite to its actual quality, which is something we can talk about, about why this pretty funny movie is considered so bad, but also because of its commercial failure. Um, it actually got to the point where there was a comic strip of The Far Side by Gary Larson, who was not known for pop cultural references. If you've ever read The Far Side, you know that it's hugely decontextualized. It's like these eternal archetypes of men and women and animals and families. It's meant to not date because of that. But there is a Far Side panel where you see all the TVs in hell are showing Ishtar. And um, Gary Larson apologized for it because in vindication of what Elaine May joked about, he'd not actually seen it. Right. Um, so Ishtar is a movie I know very well, not just because of its infamy, but because at the U of T and the University of Toronto, I teach a course on economics and cinema. And so Ishtar is an obvious case study and also a very interesting and harrowing production study. And I'll talk a little bit about that, both in my introductory remarks and probably via the questions. This is my life is a movie that I was less familiar with. I'm um, obviously very familiar with its writer, co-writer and director, Nora Ephron, and I'll talk a little bit about Ephron as well, uh, a movie that I had heard of, that I was familiar with. But again, uh, whereas Ishtar is such a big, famous flop that even if you haven't seen it, you have an opinion on it, uh, This Is My Life is a movie that kind of came and went without much notice and without much acknowledgement, uh, even though it came on the heels of Nora Ephron really becoming successful. And for you know, I mean, Efron has always been successful. I'm going to talk about the trajectory of her success, but this is her follow-up to When Harry Met Sally, a movie that she did not direct, but of which she is the unmistakable author, you know, the Oscar-nominated writer of one of the more quotable and successful and, you know, in its way, kind of iconic mainstream romantic comedies. And so for her to then move into directing, moving from being a screenwriter to a director to a director with a certain amount of control, and then for the film to kind of pass, not unnoticed, but certainly unloved uh, and, and unacclaimed, 
um, and not commercially successful. The only reason that it didn't get hammered as a flop the way Ishtar did is it didn't cost a lot of money and there wasn't a lot of pre-release kind of buzz about it the way that Ishtar had negative press. But, you know, this is my life kind of came and went and it wasn't until Efron did her follow-up Sleepless in Seattle that she was then kind of given some props again as a director. Even though Sleepless in Seattle, while ostensibly a remake of An Affair to Remember, is really just kind of a remake of When Harry Met Sally, right down to the casting of, um, of, of Meg Ryan. So Ishtar's a movie I know very well. And this is My Life is a movie that I just familiarize myself more for the purposes of this talk. And I don't want to be too imbalanced. I want to talk about both movies. What I also want to just do off the top is kind of put not just the movies, but their creators in conversation with each other. Because that's where I think this invitation uh, from, from, from Eitan and Shane actually makes a lot of sense, which is to take um, Elaine May and Nora Ephron and plot them on a kind of a continuum of upper middle brow mainstream Hollywood comedy. And also in uh, sort of counterpoint to someone who you guys have had a lecture on already, I believe in this group, which is Mike Nichols. Now, because I'm not particularly interested or fond of Mike Nichols and because you've already had a big long lecture on him, I'm not going to talk about him too much. But to set the scene, uh, his AFI Tribute Award featured speeches by both Elaine May and Nora Ephron. And I highly recommend people go to YouTube to watch these because I would say Elaine May's speech, which is about nine minutes long, easily one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Easily one of the funniest things I've ever seen. A triumphant, diabolically funny kind of tribute and attack and sort of, you know, uh, a bit of affection towards her partner, not her life partner, but her comedy partner, Mike Nichols. But there was a line in Nora Ephron's own speech, which I think is very interesting setting up today's lecture. Uh, she says, what about Elaine? Now, when Nora Ephron says, what about Elaine? Uh, in context, she's saying, why didn't Mike Nichols say Elaine May was one of the loves of his life? She's quoting Mike Nichols as saying that Julia Roberts, Meryl Streep, and my wife are the three women who I love. And Nora Ephron is saying, I feel left out. I think a lot of the brilliant women Mike Nichols has worked with are left out, but God, what about Elaine May? How could he say that? But the line, and it gets its laugh, you know, and there's a reaction shot of Mike Nichols looking chastened and everyone laughs at him. But the line, what about Elaine is just a good line because what about Elaine May? Why is Elaine May giving a speech at Mike Nichols' tribute? Where's her own tribute? And of course, the point of the Mike Nichols tribute is that he's directed 20 movies over 40 years and won an Academy Award and he's won an EGOT and all these things. And Elaine May hasn't done those things. So when you ask, where's Elaine? Well, in a sort of smug way, the answer is she's not Mike Nichols. But why isn't she Mike Nichols? I think she's considerably more than Mike Nichols. I think she's uh, got more talent in, in 20 minutes of a, uh, a movie like A New Leaf than Nichols has in some of the films that he was nominated for and won Oscars for, but the two of them are obviously joined at the hip creatively, but their trajectories are very different. And a lot of that has to do with the expectations and rules and culture, not just around men and women in Hollywood, but particularly directing and the idea of directing as a matter of, uh, as a matter of, uh, of control and of May's perception as a writer rather than a director or a writer who tried to be a director, who tried to take this idea of ideas and drama and comedy and characters from the page and sort of take it to behind the camera. And a lot of the invective and abuse that was hurled at her around the time of Ishtar was all around this idea of competence, which is a very gendered, very loaded, very sexist idea. She's not competent. She's brilliant, but she's not competent. She's a genius, but she's not competent because a director is about control and organizing people. Elaine May even said that at one point. She sort of said, you know, with writing and with acting, you operate from a place where there's a lack of control. Directing is all about control. Now, she wasn't admitting that she doesn't have that talent. She wasn't playing into the narrative that she lacks it, but she was talking about the differences in that skill set. Now, Nora Ephron is also not someone who's primarily seen as a director. She's primarily seen as a writer, and that's because she began her career as a journalist and as a literary satirist and as a magazine writer. The pieces she wrote in the late 60s and early 70s were very political, not just in terms of party politics, but very much in terms of gender politics, various waves of feminism sort of in the American discourse in the 1970s. Those were the kind of fights that she picked. Those were the kind of jokes that she told. But whereas someone like Woody Allen, who is a whole other can of worms, but was very much uh, um, her friend, 
and her contemporary as a satirist and as a literary comedian, where Woody Allen then stood out front of the work, put himself into it, not just these are his thoughts and his passions and his comedy, but himself standing there in Sleeper or in Annie Hall or in Stardust Memories, increasingly, I think, playing versions of himself. Uh, Nora Ephron was not an actor. You know, her writing um, required a set or a series of proxies. You know, she, she put herself into character, she put herself into alter egos. And um, by the time she got her break as a screenwriter via Mike Nichols, you know, writing a movie like Silkwood starring Meryl Streep and, and Cher, which is actually a very political film about, about uh, activism and nuclear power, you know, her, her reputation was made now as a writer. Um, so in this, you know, and, and then you have Elaine May, who is, who is legendary for her self-effacement and her self-deprecation, which is not modesty, God knows. It's not modesty in Elaine May's case. It's not the humility exactly. It's that uh, she was sort of acknowledged and praised for being a behind the scenes talent, She's not a star, even though she was an actor. Now, I don't wanna rush through their careers before talking about the two movies that we have, but some career context I think is necessary, especially in the case of Elaine May, because, because she doesn't have the respect and legendary status maybe that I think she deserves for some of your guests today, they might not know her older films. She makes a film, she makes a film called A New Leaf in 1971. And the timing of that movie in the early seventies, I think places her very much in the period that's called the new Hollywood this idea of very kind of uh, passionate, strong, idiosyncratic, independently minded artists migrating into the studio system and actually having their whims indulged, right? So when you look at a movie like A New Leaf, regardless of the singularity of its style or what it's about, you're talking about the same kind of movie, I would argue, as the ones being made by Robert Altman or Martin Scorsese or Hal Ashby, not the same sensibility or tone, but the same idea. And some of the same contentiousness because uh, A New Leaf was originally three hours long and had to be cut for reasons of length and for reasons of content. It's a movie about a sort of penniless, formerly rich, now penniless kind of loafer played by Walter Matthau who's trying to marry his way back into money. And he settles on this socially hopeless outcast played by Elaine May as his meal ticket. And in the original cut of the movie, before he gets to the point of wanting to seduce and murder her, he kills some other people in scenes that no one has ever seen because the production code said you cannot have a comedy about a man getting away with murder. And Elaine May was very disappointed. But um, what you have in A New Leaf and then in her follow-up, The Heartbreak Kid, which is one of the most perfect American studio comedies ever made, is you have this really interesting focus on and identification with weak men. And I would not say weak men and strong women. I would say weak men and sometimes even weaker women. Like in The Heartbreak Kid, the main character played by Charles Grodin is a shithead. He's very terrible to his fiance played by May's daughter, Jeannie Berlin. And he's very presumptuous about this blonde shiksa goddess played by Sybil Shepherd. But it's not a simple kind of boring feminist um, contraption of a, of, a, of a movie or faux feminist contraption of a movie. It's not a movie, but a lousy guy. And, you know, the, he doesn't deserve the women around him. I mean, all the characters are kind of bad. They're all really flawed. They're all really damaged. They're all sort of broken. And this idea of broken men, men who are hopeless, really, is I think where Elaine May's heart really lies. Her great masterpiece is Mikey and Nikki, which is made in the mid 1970s stars John Cassavetes and Peter Falk as lifetime friends who kind of get embroiled with the mob and they have a long dark night of the soul where they're kind of being pursued and antagonizing each other. It's very Cassavetes-ish. It's one of the most uncompromising and heartbreaking movies I've ever seen about men. And it also made her very, very much in the style and spirit of these 70s directors who wouldn't take no for an answer. She thought she shot like 3 million feet of film on Mikey and Nikki, and this was not a special effects movie. Famously, she shot more film than they shot on Gone with the Wind. And the great story about Mikey and Nikki, one of the greatest anecdotes I've ever heard about a director, is there's a scene where Cassavetes and Peter Falk are improvising and fighting with each other, and they walk out the door, out the set, and disappear. And the DP is going to call cut. And Elaine May says, don't you dare call cut. And the cinematographer said, but they're gone. And she said, well, they might come back. And that idea of exploring and improvising is native to her, 
to her style and to her art, but it also meant that the movie went over budget. And here is where we have, I think, the most relevant point pertaining to Ishtar. The studio punished her for the way she made the movie. The studio basically said, you wasted our time, you wasted our money, and the sunk cost of the movie now is, is on your head, and they didn't support it. And that's the situation that led Warren Beatty, another figurehead of the new Hollywood, to try in a gesture that I think is halfway between chivalry and exploitation to lift Elaine May up. And if you read Peter Biskin's book about uh, Warren Beatty, there's a whole chapter on Ishtar, which suggests that by going to Columbia and saying, we want Elaine to write and direct a movie, we wanna give her full, full control, let her do whatever you want. This was Warren Beatty trying in some ways to help his friend, famously the one woman who wouldn't sleep with him in a very kind of reductive way. That was Elaine May's role in the boys club of the new Hollywood and, uh, and of Warren Beatty's orbit. And yet as the movie was made, he completely backstabbed her. He undermined her. He undermined her directly and indirectly. He undermined her to her face and undermined her in the press. This small, slight, would-be Hope and Crosby redux road movie about two hopeless musicians who get sent to the Middle East and end up involved in a sort of foreign cloak and dagger diplomacy intrigue. This small little movie ballooned over budget, over schedule, but unlike Mike and, Mikey and Nikki, which was small scale enough that it could bear that kind of stress, uh, the movie became a punchline before anybody saw it. And this is where the rhetoric that Elaine May was in over her head came in. She doesn't know how to use the camera. She doesn't know how to budget a day in the desert. Dustin Hoffman said the movie should have stayed in New York, that he wanted the whole movie to be him and Warren Beatty playing like a bad version of Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, the head of the studio, David Putnam, sort of badmouthed the movie in the press because it had been okayed before he had joined Columbia. The executive who greenlit it was sort of gone. There were political problems shooting in Morocco with a Jewish movie star. There was a rebellion going on militarily, which mirrored the plot of the movie almost exactly, but did not make for an easy shooting location. And because in the 80s, focus and fixation was on movies budgets in the wake of Heaven's Gate, Ishtar became a story before anyone saw the movie. And so instead of the narrative of, an un of a principled, uncompromising, hard-headed artist, refusing to let the studio tell them what to do, uh, May was seen as weak, right? Or she was seen as out of her depth. And after the flops of movies like New York, New York and Heaven's Gate, even if the industry didn't like those movies, there was something for film critics to grab onto and romanticize about these tough alpha males. And some critics gave May that due, and some critics saw her in that mold, which I think was the correct way to see her. But for the most part, it was seen as evidence that when push came to shove in a big physical foreign set production, that a female director lost her nerve. Beyond the effect that this had on Elaine May's career, the fact that she didn't ever direct another movie, that she moved back to doing a lot of uncredited script work or writing movies again for Mike Nichols, who unlike Warren Beatty sort of supported her without then undermining her. You know, he got her to write Primary Colors in the Birdcage. She was Oscar nominated for those films. Uh, beyond what it did to May's career, it symbolically seemed to be a real pushback or a slap in the face of the idea of women in Hollywood getting big budget studio movies. That doesn't mean it's Elaine May's fault beyond the fact that Elaine May did nothing wrong, <laughs> but symbolically, the fact that this movie that came to stand in for all of Hollywood's horrible excesses in the late eighties happened to be directed by this eccentric idiosyncratic, you know, female comedian who's getting her big shot, that had a really bad perceptual effect. Now, shortly after Ishtar, you have Efron making It's My, uh, it's my Life. Are the movies, actually related? No, it's a tangential relationship, but it's an interesting move for Efron. Efron put her personal life on display in a movie called Heartburn, which was adapted from her own memoir about being married to Carl Bernstein. And we can talk about this in the Q&A maybe, but there's a whole crazy narrative that in the 70s, Efron and Bernstein tried writing a draft of all the president's men that made Carl Bernstein a sexy, hip, womanizing hero. You know, uh, That was also where the relationship with Dustin Hoffman started because Hoffman played Bernstein and all the president's men. But uh, Heartburn very much put Efron's life on display. And there's sometimes an expectation with female authors, maybe more in 
in literature than in films, but this idea of writing autobiography, you know, you don't filter or disguise, you just write yourself. And sometimes that's denigrated somehow as less creative or less imaginative. But Heartburn was very well regarded, partially because it was skillfully directed by Mike Nichols. And so for It's My Life, uh, you have this displaced autobiography. The book was, the, the novel was written by Meg Wallitzer. And it's a novel about uh, a divorced mother of two named Dottie who wants to go be a stand-up comedian. And she wants to be a stand-up comedian in spite of her lack of industry connection or experience, in spite of her age. And in the novel, even more than in the ultimate film version, the idea that she's not conventionally telegenic in the novel, it's called attention to the fact that not only is she in her early 40s with two kids, but that she's overweight. She doesn't want to present herself in any kind of sexualized way. She wants the jokes to kind of stand for themselves. And Efron and It's My Life turns this character as played by Julie Kavner, I think, in writing the script with her sister, Julie Efron, turns her into a version of herself in that it's about how do you succeed as a comedian? How do you succeed in show business? How do you balance this idea of wanting to be successful with having a personal life? This is a very 80s theme, this capitalized idea of how do you have it all? You look at movies like Baby Boom or even Working Girl directed by Mike Nichols, you know, deal with this theme in certain ways. Interesting that a lot of these movies tend to be directed by men, but It's My Life is directed by, by Efron. And she casts Julie Kavner as Dottie, the, 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 the woman who wants to go from the makeup counter to sort of Johnny Carson. And the movie ends up being very much about her relationship with her two daughters, teenager played by Samantha Mathis, preteen played by Gabby Hoffman, and the kind of emotional wreckage that ensues of her being away. And this is an interesting little crossover with Ishtar because they're both movies about show business. I mean, Ishtar has this acidic, vicious view of show business about these completely untalented people who are so inept and so unlikely to succeed in show business, all they can do is move in inadvertently to politics and espionage. And it's a sort of satire of Reagan era misadventure in the Middle East. So the showbiz is a bit of a pretense to get into this adventure plot, almost a quasi action movie plot actually. But uh, It's My Life has a pretty, I think, and this is maybe where we'll talk about this in the Q and A, it wants to be sardonic and it wants to be critical, but it's a pretty cozy view of show business. It actually really has a view of show business as a kind of meritocracy. The fact that Dottie is funny is enough and it softens all the people around her. I think if Efron had an on-screen alter ego, it's Carrie Fisher, who's never quite at the center of her movies, but is always close to it. They were friends in real life. And Fisher is like a, a perfect delivery device for Efron's version of comedy. And you know, here she plays a character who's coded very much as like a showbiz barracuda or a neurotic agent type. But in the end, she's nice. And Dan Aykroyd, who plays her, her manager, or not her manager, plays this sort of big mucky muck talent agent uh, who looks like he's gonna be a sleaze and is coded by the movie sleaze, he's pretty nice. And the talk shows are nice and the industry is nice. And it feels a little bit like a movie made by a front runner trying to imagine that she's struggling because by the early nineties, Nora Ephron is as successful in her way as any screenwriter of that age and vintage. But she's trying to imagine someone who's trying to make it. And she's also imagining a movie, and this is all taken from the novel, where the mother struggles to balance her aspirations with her parenting. And the movie contrives, I think, and contrived is the word, this really melodramatic third act where the kids get so sick of their mom that they like leave and try and go find their dad and take a train. But there's never a real sense of danger, nor is there ever really a sense that anybody's done anything wrong. The characters say things like, you've broken my heart, you're hurting me, I hate you, I never want to see you again. And this has to do with Efron's directing. There's a kind of flatness to it, where as well written as the script is and kind of as, as intricately structured as it is, you don't really get a sense of danger and spontaneity. It's like a movie that tells you in the first two minutes, everything's gonna be all right. And 90 minutes later, it, it still is. And that I think is a little, that very indicative of the difference in sensibility between May and Efron, where Efron is a really, intricate, sophisticated writer of dialogue and shtick, you know, of these set up punchline jokes. It's why she's, I think, very equipped to make a movie about a woman who wants to be an observational stand-up. 
Whereas I think Elaine May is willing to let things get weird and long. And again, to let people wander away and keep the camera running because she wonders about what's gonna happen. I think it's very telling that even if Efron's film was received, let's say flatly, that she got to keep directing because I think as a talent, and Efron is a ta was a talent, you know, you could count on and rely on certain things, certain expectations that she was able to, to work within. So Sleepless in Seattle, You've Got Mail, which is a remake of a wonderful Lubitsch film called The Shop Around the Corner. And then later even Julie and Julia. You know, these are movies that don't offer a lot of surprises. They offer pleasure, but not a lot of surprise. The problem I would say is that in engineering that pleasure, she didn't get a lot of credit even for doing that. Because in the 90s, and I have a bit of memory of this, I'm not an old person, I'm 40, and I started reviewing films in the early 2000s, but I can tell you that films like Hanging Up and Lucky Numbers and even The Shop Around the Corner, commercially they got respect, but they were not written about very seriously by film critics, especially in a business that was hugely male, and hugely male dominated. So even a really well-written and entertaining film like Hanging Up is sort of dismissed as lightweight because it's female themed and female directed. So Efron's films made money and no one is crying for Nora Efron for getting to make big movies with movie stars well into her 60s and 70s. But the critical respect was not really there. And none of these films, This Is My Life Included, have really uh, metastasized a lot of retrospective critical respect. It's like they did okay at the time and that's about all people think of them now. Whereas May, in the kamikaze failure of Ishtar has kind of now become raised up and elevated as a hero. I wrote a book a few years ago with a movie called Showgirls and I'm not gonna hijack this lecture by talking about Showgirls, but Showgirls like Ishtar and Heaven's Gate is like synonymous with the idea of bad. And Showgirls is a movie that's now been hugely reevaluated as being good. And it's gotten to the point now with Ishtar that you are more likely to find people who think it's good and will look at you sideways for saying it's bad than the opposite. It's kind of a movie that aged into and found its context a little later on. And in a way, for Elaine May's reputation, uh, Ishtar's debacle was a good thing for her because now it allows everyone to write pieces about how she's misunderstood and, and a sort of tragic figure. She doesn't see it that way. I mean, her career got wrecked. So the fact that it's an interesting critical talking point that Ishtar was misunderstood and underrated doesn't do anything for all the movies Elaine May didn't get to make as a result. And she's talked about that and critics have talked about that. The New Yorker's Richard Brody wrote that it's one of the great tragedies in American cinema that we didn't get to see what else Elaine May could do because other directors flame out and fail all the time. When Martin Scorsese made Raging Bull in 1980, just considered one of the great American films. It was a complete box office flop. And then he immediately got to make something else and something else and something else. Elaine May made Ishtar and, you know, that was it. And some of that was by her own choice and her own reticence. And some of that was because she was stung by the experience. But again, a lot of that had to do with a really kind of pernicious narrative around that movie and why as brilliant as she was as a writer and as a performer, the idea of why she failed as a director failing in those categories of competency and control, which were some of the same criticisms levied at Efron for, for This Is My Life, where people would say when she's writing a script like When Harry Met Sally, she's great. When she's trying to direct and control that script and work with actors, she's sort of less so. Now, in talking about these two films, maybe this can now come out in the question period, some of the specifics of what's in them, what works in them, and, and, and what doesn't. But even though I say that I prefer Ishtar, that I'm more familiar with Ishtar, I'm super interested to talk about this in my life. Because, and Eitan mentioned this when we were setting up this discussion, I did go on to Letterboxd, which is a user-generated film review site where these are not professional critics. So a lot of professional critics use it, myself included. Uh, it's like a sleeker, better, more operable version of message boards or the internet movie database where you can sort of just see people weighing in on films. And in going to This Is My Life and seeing the people writing about it, it's hugely younger female film fans, younger female cinephiles. And the person who cued them to the film is Lena Dunham, who could be the subject of a whole other lecture. But Lena Dunham, as part of, I think, the very pedigreed, privileged New York culturati scene, the same one Nora Ephron came out of. She's very aware of her elders. She's very aware of her forebears. Huge fan of Nora Ephron. 
And there is a really interesting interview that you can find online of Lena Dunham talking to Efron about This Is My Life. And she describes the film worshipfully. Mm-hmm. She's talking about the film like, you know, you have these young male directors talking about Raging Bull or talking about Nashville. And so I think the film does have some influence and does have some legacy in that sense. Um, so again, you know, Ishtar is a movie so infamous that you kind of have an opinion on it if you haven't seen it. This is my life is a movie that even someone like me who watches movies for a living didn't actually catch up with until I realized I wanted to talk about it here. So there is a contrast there. Uh, but I think that the, 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 the comparisons and contrasts and contradictions between May and, and Efron would be super interesting to go into now. So I think that this has kind of set it up and now I turn it over to you or rather I'm ready to answer whatever you want to ask. Yeah, well, thank you so much for once again for being here. It's, you know, it's a real treat for me since I've enjoyed your writing for so long. It's interesting, actually, I hadn't realized that Lena Dunham, I had noticed that on Letterboxd and I had noticed that um, a lot of younger female voices that I respected were really interested in this movie and starting to write about it. Yeah. And that was actually kind of why we primed this for this series, uh, for this particular um, rubric of the reappraisal. And I do want to ask you about that category and yeah. some meta questions about that category, why people go back to movies. But really for here, it, it was kind of opposite reasons. You have this notorious flop and a fiasco that appears to be in a cycle of being reappraised. And you also had this other movie that wasn't really a flop per se, as opposed to just a kind of quiet movie that you know, maybe it didn't do well, but it wasn't a problem as you indicated. It, it just, it's another movie that was made. And yet at the same time, it's an important filmmaker from an important, from an adaptation of a book by a woman who is increasingly important, Meg Wolitzer, um, in contemporary literature, and it's just gained in reputation. And this movie yet seemed to have almost kind of no lasting legacy and no lineage. And it seemed to be kind of kind of lost to time. And it was particularly interesting, I think, because well, the genre that we most associate Efron with is the romantic comedy. And we think of her as this master of romantic comedy, but instead of trying to do that for her directorial debut, she has something that is much more quasi-autobiographical, that is much more of a place to ground um, her ars poetica of, you know, everything is copy, everything is the subject for material. And even if that is devastating to my own family, I'm going to pursue it because yes, in the end, I'm going to be able to find a way to kind of soften that blow. I can also, you know, kind of come back to being, you know, a mother in that regard. So I'm wondering, um, what, what do you think it mean, that me- meant as a gesture? And maybe we can use this also as a way to kind of segue into that discussion of, of reappraisal in general, of where are these two movies on the kind of perspective slopes? Well, I, 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 I kind of made it sound in my remarks a little bit like May had, you know, the whole world pushing against her, whereas Efron kind of eased into this assignment and, you know, depending on how you feel about the movie, either bungled it or didn't quite ace it. But I should say that one of the most interesting anecdotes about This Is My Life was Efron talking about the producer at Columbia, John Peters. So the the films also share a studio. And if you read uh, the history of Hollywood, John Peters, who also produced uh, Tim Burton's Batman, he was like a real bad boy, badass sort of late 80s sort of coke fueled tyrant kind of producer and this is the industry stereotype that has been in movies about movies for 50 years they were making movies about these kinds of guys in the 30s and 40s because these were the kinds of guys producing movies in the 30s and 40s the archetype kept updating we might say that you know it just got more and more coked out as we got into the 70s or the 80s but the basic idea of the kind of slick, high concept, seen it all studio guru is something that people actually internalized and tried to live out. And in the 80s, that was people like Don Simpson, Jerry Bruckheimer, even in the indie arena, you get a version of that with Harvey Weinstein, who despite his patronage of the arts, and you know, the fact that he was supposedly still drawn to, you know, sensitive or more, more demographically diverse kinds of films like Shakespeare and Love. I mean, he's very much an alpha. And we know the, set, the other half of that story now too. But anyway, John Peters told Nora Ephron famously, I've made 65 movies and I've never read a script and I'm not gonna start now. So why don't you tell me about your movie? 
And this was in the context of a meeting with all male executives. And at that point, John Peters was dating this kind of flash in the pan supermodel, one name person named Vendela, who was sort of a late eighties, early nineties kind of, you know, C-list celebrity. I'm not trying to put her down. I'm just saying she's not someone who's endured through history. And he, she was kind of his trophy girlfriend at the time. And Efron talked about how this intricate novel by Meg Wolitzer and this complex motif of, uh, you know, performing different kinds of femininity or performing different roles. You're a worker, you're a mother, you, you know, you're a divorced person who's possibly sort of, you know, trying to get back out into the world romantically and sexually. And then you have this character you play on, on stage. I mean, for her, it was all the writing. It was a script based on a novel that she'd written with her sister about someone who's trying to write a movie that has this dueling voiceover setup. And here you have this male producer saying, well, you can tell me about your movie. And that was where she sort of felt that she wasn't getting the kind of support or indulgence or interest that, you know, she wanted. She still got to make it, right? I and mean, that's the thing you always have to remember about Efron is through her talent and through her success, she was always working. She never got the industry, no door ever slammed in Nora Efron's face. I think the people who describe her positively and negatively have said she was sort of a creature of success and a creature of networking. She seemed to know everybody and know everything about everybody. So the John Peters anecdote isn't meant to suggest that she was being marginalized, but it is maybe being meant to suggest that the movie was sort of out of step with what studios wanted to push and support at that time. And in the end, the comment you made about it not being a romantic comedy, I think is part of its commercial failure. Because one thing that's not in the movie, not not in it at all, but there's very little romance, there's very little sex, there's very little sexiness, at least as a kind of out front sort of thing. And its overall texture is one I think of kind of kindness and softness. And I'm not trying to use those terms in a boring way. <laughs> I'm not trying to use those terms in a reductive way, but it's not a movie of hard edges. You know, and I think that that made it in some ways kind of hard to hard to push. I think now in an era of compulsory irony or compulsory post irony, you look back at the movie and it feels somewhat cozy and nostalgic. It has that texture of coziness to it, which might be what someone like Lena Dunham is kind of responding to. So why don't we talk a little bit about the notion of reappraisal in, generally, in general. So you wrote a book on Showgirls and why it doesn't suck. I did. There is a very vocal following online for the theatrical cut of Miami Vice, of Michael Mann's Miami yeah. Vice. Why, why have these movies kind of emerged as shibboleths of modern film criticism? You know, how does gender play into this whole category of reappraisal? Is it as reductive and... and it's easy to say that we're more likely to engage with the, you know, the work of a kind of difficult male visionary than we are with a woman, that Michael Cimino is more easy to return to than Elaine May, or to sort of say, we've thought about Nora Ephron in this one particular vein, but now we want to think of her in a kind of, as a more totalitarian, to, in a more totalistic way. I mean, the impulse behind reappraisal has to do with the fact that there's a long literary and artistic and cinematic tradition of things that are either ahead of the curve. I'm going to use a bunch of cliches here, ahead of the curve, on the cutting edge, you know, they're, they're, they're the smartest movie in the room, you know, that sort of thing. And there's a lot of cultural capital and a lot of cultural currency in sticking your neck out after the fact and saying, actually, it was good. Now, there's more in sticking your neck out when the thing happens. And so when I was writing about Showgirls, I sort of tried to say, you know, the boldness is not 20 years later writing about Showgirls actually being good. It's actually charting how that happened and who made that happen. The movie didn't change, but the willingness of people to approach it and to put their name and put their byline and put their space to the idea of parsing and probing this bad object and this hated object. But yeah, what you're saying about, you know, the, the, the tough misunderstood male visionary, that's a sort of seductive trope. Um, I think that one of the reasons that This Is My Life has not been reclaimed as, pa well, I'm just gonna say, it's not been reclaimed as passionately as Ishtar because I don't think it's as good a movie. And I think that in some ways, the insane hubbub around Ishtar, much like the insane hubbub around show, Showgirls, obliges reclamation 
and reappraisal. You know, it's like the bigger the catastrophe, the more the impulse to sort through the wreckage and sort of say, actually, you know, this is why it exploded or it was meant to explode or it's not a bomb at all. You know, I mean, I talk about that a lot in the showroom's book. I think that with It's My Life, there's just not a lot of passion or circumstance or craziness around it. It's again, that idea of something passing unnoticed more than anything else. But I also think that as I was saying, the kindness of it, the gentleness of it, the, the coziness of it feels like a transmission from another you know, universe now. And I think that now that there is a lot more discussion and a lot more maybe space and, and patience and urgency to talk about this idea of women directing movies in the United States, you look at the F this movie and people say, what, she directed this? I mean, she directed a movie at the same time she was writing When Harry Met Sally. She wasn't just a writer for hire. She wasn't just Mike Nichols' killer screenwriter, but, you know, she tried to make a movie. The curiosity is the first thing, you know, that sort of happens. And then I think the, you know, the, the, the movie itself yields a certain amount of, uh, a certain amount of sympathetic analysis, because while I'm describing it as cozy and gentle, it's also trying to do a lot of things. And I think that seeing that it's not just capitulating to a romantic comedy formula, right? Or in the case of Shop Around the Corner, uh, you got mail, you know, not just updating and remaking this kind of romantic comedy perennial, but I mean, this is my life is trying to do something very interesting. And when you say that it's a movie about how everything is material, it makes it very personal, I think, to Nora Ephron. I mean, Nora Ephron had made Heartburn you know, co-written Harper, but also had to sit there while people said, this is a good or bad movie, depending on how I feel about Nora Ephron's right or Nora Ephron's privilege to talk about her marriage, her celebrity marriage to this male writer, this philandering journalist. And so I think after Heartburn, for her to make a movie about a woman who's trying to make comedy, stand-up comedy and show business success out of her life, out of what she thinks of her kids, out of what she thinks of her family, out of what she thinks of her job, I think that that's where the movie starts getting some kind of retrospective reappraisal interest because it ceases to be this <clears throat> movie that came and passed without notice, but it seems like this very personal testament. And because Nora Ephron is famous and because Nora Ephron in her way is kind of important, there's some stakes or some urgency in, in going back to it and sort of trying to lift it up a little bit. But I don't think it's a movie you can lift that high. And that's not me undermining the discussion that we're having or trying to put it down. I don't think it's a movie to put down, but I don't know how high you can really lift it just based on what it is. I think with Ishtar, it's so far down, you know, buried beneath stratum after stratum of contempt and disdain and disgust and misrecognition that the effort of pulling it up seems like really heroic. And then there's things in Ishtar, which by the way, I don't think is perfect, but I think is pretty great. You really can hold it up and sort of say, wow, they did some funny stuff in this movie. Why did people not think it was funny at the time? I wonder if we can think about the question of ownership and ownership and reappraisal, and not just in a kind of economic sense, which you hinted at before, who owns the film, right? And uh, Elaine May helping to kind of repurchase Mikey and Nikki in order to kind of produce yeah. a cut that people could watch. But this question of ownership and narrative and ownership and storytelling. So last week, actually, we spoke to Eliza Hitman about her film Beach Rats. And there was a point in the conversation when she revealed that she didn't really get to have a lot of nuanced discussions about the substance of the film when it was first released because people couldn't get past the idea of the storyteller and the issue of the fact that she, a straight woman, was making this movie about gay men and that it didn't conform to most conventions of LGBTQ coming of age stories. Um, so they couldn't get past the idea that she, in some ways, didn't own this story. It belonged to someone else. So how much of the kind of reception of reappraised, reappraised works actually maybe could stew to kind of unconfronted questions of ownership, of who gets to tell what story, and what does it mean if they tell it in a way that someone doesn't like? So Elaine May, yes, with the struggle for ownership with, you know, A New Leaf and with Mikey and Nikki and authority to tell this story, but it's also that she's so interested in penetrating male friendship and male psychopathology. And so is there, in part of this perception, you know, a sense and a feeling that maybe this wasn't her story to tell that takes kind of decades to move away from? Well, in the case of Ishtar, I mean, there was a ready-made kind of jerry-rigged genre behind it because it was supposed to be a Hope and Crosby movie. It was gonna be called The Road to Ishtar. And I think that that's deceptive because it makes the film seem impersonal. 
right? It makes it seem very boardroom high concept, which is remember Bob Hope and Bing Crosby used to travel around the world or backlot versions of the world. And they were kind of charming and kind of racist and there were dancing girls everywhere and they were kind of ugly Americans, but very sweet and they'd sing a song. Let's do that, but let's do it with Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman. And it'll be a tribute to a kind of bygone, very shticky showbiz subgenre. And that doesn't sound very personal. And that makes it sound like a movie that's packaged rather than a movie like Mikey and Nikki that is kind of willed, I think, very passionately into the world. And the packaging of Ishtar is very fascinating because Beatty got paid $6 million to produce and star. And we cannot overstate what a power player Warren Beatty was at that point. He won the Oscar for directing Reds. He's Warren Beatty. You know, this is like people fall at his feet, men, women, children, dogs. I mean, he's Warren Beatty. He's one of the new Hollywood people who didn't flop. There was no Warren's uh, Heaven's Gate. Ishtar was Warren Beatty's Heaven's Gate in a way. But you know, Beatty got paid 6 million bucks. Hoffman got paid 5 million. May got paid a million, which was the first time that a female creative in Hollywood was paid seven figures, but it's a fraction of what they were paid. But by the end, she didn't just penetrate male pathology and friendship in the movie. I mean, she and Beatty and Hoffman were all at each other's throats. If you read Biskin's book, they each had their own team of editors making three different cuts. There were two camera crews, you know, Beatty was going up to her on the set and saying, they can't fire you all quit. And then in secret, he was saying, Elaine doesn't know what she's, what she's doing. They were all kind of backbiting each other in the press. There was no solidarity. There was no sort of friendship. And when you talk about ownership, I think it's because Beatty is just an absolute control freak. You know, in a way he wanted to be Orson Welles, but handsomer. I mean, he's not the same kind of filmmaker as Welles, but Beatty was a writer, director, producer, star. And Ishtar had every bit of those hallmarks, except that he let someone else direct it. Because May had worked with Beatty on Heaven Can Wait. I mean, they're pals. I mean, I can't overstate how tight they were before doing this and how much, again, this was supposed to be Beatty white knighting Elaine May and lifting her up after what happened with Mikey and Nikki and saying, well, here's your shot. But that's not how it actually played out. And part of what made Ishtar so fraught was the actual creative granular question of ownership. Is Warren Beatty making this movie secretly? Is Elaine making this movie? Why does Dustin Hoffman have his own team of editors, you know, working on a cut that kind of makes him look better? But I think that when you're talking about, you know, does personal connection and ownership tie into reappraisal? I mean, I, I think it does, but in the case of Ishtar, I don't think that it's the leading factor because the leading factor is just the public spectacle of the movie's perceived crappiness, you know? That, that, that perceived crappiness, I think actually transcends Elaine May because it's not, for example, to go back to the Far Side comic, it's not like Gary Larson's comic and then had a little caricature of Elaine May. I mean, in some ways she's less famous than the movie, but in industry terms, or in film critical terms, everyone knew that she was the one who, who made it. And she kind of took the fall. I mean, as people are very fond of pointing out, she, done, she never made another movie. A year later, Warren Beatty got $45 million to make Dick Tracy, a vanity project where he plays a character who's like at least 15 years, at least 15 years too old. And he gets to be on screen with Madonna and shoot a Tommy gun and be a superhero. Like it's his version of making Batman. Good for him. I love Dick Tracy. I grew up on Dick Tracy. I'm just saying consequences are not created equal, but people would say, well, yeah, Elaine May takes the hit because she directed it and she did direct it and she directed parts of it brilliantly. But the other problem was that, uh, on set, no one seemed to want to let her direct at all. She was she was basically being told supposedly by Beatty, don't put the camera there, which is a really, uh, <laughs> really at odds with the idea that he wanted her to make the movie in the first place, so. Right. You know, it, it's funny because the film kind of ends up enacting what it was, uh, what it was about, that you have these two ostensible Hollywood stars who are coming together to make this movie in which they go to the Middle East and it's going to be a very big success and they're going to revive their friend's career um, by playing bungling lounge singers. And instead, they're the ones who bungle everything by going to the Middle East and creating this flop that might as well be called Shea Casablanca. Um, and at the same time, it is very, very smart and very, very clever. Um, I'm going to abbreviate the discussion on Ishtar a little bit so that we can ask some more questions on This Is My Life. But I do want to ask the question of Jewishness uh, and talk about that a little bit, because 
You know, a friend of mine recently described May's first movie, A New Leaf, as being a certain kind of Jew's fantasy of a certain kind of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant and how that white, accent, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant behaves in the world. But the rest of her movies are really not afraid to embrace Jewishness at all and to have it just be a very explicit part of it. So um, telling the truth is a bitter herb as the original lyric for telling the, tr- for telling the truth is. Very funny. Right, it's, it's very funny because of A, how terrible a line it is, but also it's Jewish specificity. Who is going to think of saying bitter herb except some Jews who just had, had Passover recently? Um, so you know, Mikey and, Nishi, and Nikki really pushes the kind of notion of Jewish mobsters into multiple directions. So a commentary on acting and acting techniques, but also a, a real kind of discussion on eschatology and the afterlife and what to expect and how that might differ from Judaism and Catholicism as this character is facing death. So how do we understand the Jewishness of Ishtar? I mean, I got a PhD in Yiddish literature, I think just so I could talk about the, the schmuck smuck scene. Um, but you know, I guess what I wanna know is, is this the Jewish humor of the heartbreak kid? Or is it the pathos of Mikey and Nikki? Or are we in kind of a third zone with the Jewishness and the conception of it in, in Ishtar? I think you're in a third kind of hybrid zone. And I think that it's the only one of her movies that deals with celebrity, right? I mean, Dustin Hoffman as a Jewish celebrity had to hire extra security while they were making the film because of the socio-political situation. And that's the other way the movie's an allegory of itself, right? I mean, you say no talent stars, movie stars play no talent stars, both of them kind of end up, you know, going to this mythical Middle Eastern kingdom and, and screwing up. I mean, that's a very rich and suggestive part of reading the movie. But no, there is a lot of, I would say, coded or or, or direct Jewish comedy in, in Ishtar, particularly around the idea of failure, particularly around the idea that these guys are, you know, schmucks or smucks, you know, this idea that they, they're they're not up to the plans that they've made for themselves. And the comedy comes from that. It's also a movie that's very much about deception and duplicity. And that's where she kind of gets it, male friendship, which is the second they get there and this woman played by Isabella Johnny is between them. There's just total lies, deception and duplicity. And you can't work creatively when you're keeping things from people. And when you're, when you're, you know, harboring secrets and, and hidden agendas, another way the movie kind of becomes an allegory of itself, you know, that no one, that no one trusts anybody. But I think that the, you know, in some ways, the Jewish humor in it is a very old, again, kind of sticky, post vaudeville, very kind of old Hollywood kind of humor. It's jokes, it's one liners, it's that kind of almost reflexive or kind of gag reflexive comedy where everyone's a comedian, you know, and I think that Hoffman, maybe more than Beatty is skilled at leaning into that self-deprecation because Beatty's whole thing as a movie star, Jewishness or not, is vanity. Mm -hmm. The movie tries to kind of undermine that vanity, but I think he maybe overplays the fake vanity a bit. I mean, the joke is the joke is that Hoffman's the ladies man and Beatty is kind of the loser, which is one of those jokes that's not really a joke. Beatty, I don't think fully totally commits to it. I mean, he knows he's born Beatty, he knows he's cute, all that. But um, I think maybe I think maybe more or in concert with the Jewishness, there's just the geopolitical satire of it, right? I mean, this is a movie that suggests that the CIA is the real power behind the throne. And that the CIA, as, as embodied by Charles Grodin, who was such an avatar of corruption in the heartbreak kid, not political corruption, but kind of moral corruption and a particularly Jewish kind of aspiration. I mean, I've described that movie as a movie about a schmuck who ends up in the wasp nest, literally, right? I mean, he throws over his very earthy, voluptuous, all too human and fleshy Jewish bride, played by May's daughter, for Sybil Shepherd who's this blonde goddess in a football jersey and a bikini. And of course the joke at the end of the Heartbreak Kid, spoiler for those of you who haven't seen it, is he's still miserable because Elaine May's fundamentally comic and maybe Jewish existentialism is, you know, doesn't matter who you're with, you're always with yourself. And the the, the, the character in, in Heartbreak Kid is always gonna be miserable. But yeah, in, uh, in Ishtar, Grodin is there as, you know, an emissary of the CIA and the film has absolutely no faith, trust, or respect for those kind of institutions. It's politically a very kind of subversive movie. Um, and those are all things that I think would have been seen with more clarity and analyzed with more depth and fulsomeness if people could have gotten over the budget 
where people could have gotten over the gossip. Now, when people dive into the movie, these are things that are taken apart and deconstructed, I think very reverently and respect respectably. But at the time, you could not find a review that was willing to ask the kind of question you just asked. No one was sort of saying, you know, how Jewish is Ishtar? Or where does this fit on May's, you know, thematic continuum? They were all just saying, how'd they waste all this money? How the, why is this movie opening six months later? And some of the best revisionist writing on Ishtar, and again, including Richard Brody in The New Yorker, is saying there's a special place in hell for the wing of film criticism, dating back even to things like Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor, but certainly Heaven's Gate and Ishtar, a special place in hell for the wing of film criticism and entertainment journalism that got it into people's minds that a movie that didn't make money is a waste that money was wasted if it's not recouped. Because that's not how audiences or critics should think. That's how producers should think, but not the way really that art should be appraised. Ishtar is not the only movie that you can use as a thought experiment in that area, but I think it's a pretty good one. It's funny, you, you talk about the, the end of the Heartbreak Kid of him, you know, him being just as miserable as he was before. But I, I think there's even another joke there where that movie seems to be kind of messing with the idea of The Graduate and some of the freedom that was happening in The Graduate. And we have Benjamin Braddock driving around in his Alfa Romeo and Charles Grodin's character in The Heartbreak Kid has just as, a, just as absurd a small car that he drives around. But the, the last scene in this, um, you know, in The Heartbreak Kid, it's not only that he's with this family and that he has to endure trying to get a job and be a part of this life as he's there and miserable. It's that he now has to, he has to pitch himself. So Benjamin Braddock can be there and have people talk to him about going into plastics and just appear miserable. Whereas Charles Grodin's character has to say, oh, plastics, please tell me about that. I love that industry. I love everything that's going on there. It works so perfectly. Um, I did have another question, which I think could function maybe as a bridge to going back to This Is My Life, and I'll encourage people to leave some more questions in the chat that we're going to get to. Um, do these movies take place in our universe? And you know, by that I mean, how do we make unpack their tone, and how do we think of their tone? You know, there's times when Ishtar seems to kind of want to go in a neo screwball direction, setting up the confusion, but it doesn't really quite go for it. Instead, it kind of has this fable like quality to it of you know these two people who are actually messengers from god if you could see it that way or at least fall into that notion um warren Beatty's background is supposedly he was content working at a filling station and then his town got a new factory so it industrialized and he decided he needed to be a songwriter in the big in the big city um none of this it kind of makes logical sense and yet it all works with the themes of self-deception you know in the movie and at the same token I wonder if we can see this is my life as a kind of fable because again, as you say, it imagines Hollywood as this meritocracy. It imagines show business as this place where if you are successful, you can kind of keep going and you can bracket out the struggle to actually have um, commercial success. That you could say this person will just get from A to B and now we can tell this movie about what does getting to B do to our family. They are both movies that in a way end with the show business aspirations vindicated. But in Ishtar, it's a joke. It's like, well, you guys did all this clandestine espionage stuff kind of behind the scenes. And so now instead of just propping up, you know, a puppet regime or instead of propping up insurrection, you know, the American government is gonna prop up your garbage <laughs> music, right? And the idea is that the CIA kind of signs on almost as their record contractors or their, their backers. And you have this moment where they succeed. And the only success that matters is that Isabella Johnny's character says they're wonderful. And I would again agree that Isabella Johnny telling you you're wonderful is all the vindication or validation anyone would ever need in life. But I mean, at the end of Ishtar, the idea isn't that they are great artists who got waylaid and have found themselves or even that they're making great art out of what happened to them. It's that they still suck, but now they can call in a favor, right? And I think that that is very much our universe. And I think it makes Ishtar in spite of its fable-like qualities. And again, it's very anachronistic Hope Crosby qualities. I think it's a realistic film. And I think that as ridiculous as the scene where they're out on the roof where he's gonna kill himself and Beatty's like, it takes a lot of guts to be a failure at your age. Most people wouldn't even you know, be willing to be a, a, a failure, but you, know, you're, you, you, have, you have the courage to fail at, in middle age. It's an absurd scene but it's av absolutely rooted in kind of realistic pathology, kind of realistic sad sack, you know, uh, you know ma ma male pathology. It's an interesting question when you ask if this is my life takes place in our universe, because when I watched with my wife on the weekend, they sell their house after the great aunt dies and 
they're like, oh, it's going to be tough, but you know, we're going to make it to, to Manhattan. We're going to go make it. And so you have all the signifiers of rolling up your sleeves. You have the car ride and they're wearing a kerchief and they're painting and doing all this, but it's like, this is a gigantic apartment. It's the kind of jokes that David Wayne tells in his brilliant Nora Ephron parody and they came together, which is all about, you know, the apartments are so big, the ceilings are so high, everything's so bright. I mean, New York isn't like that. And I think This Is My Life is trying to be set in our universe. And it's not an unrealistic film. I think it's a very realistic film for Nora Ephron. I think it is infused by memories, even if they're Meg Wallitzer's memories, or even if she and Delia Ephron are translating Wallitzer's uh, you know, narrative. They are a romanticized idea of when you haven't quite made it from someone who has. I think it's very telling that the most diverting and believable parts of the movie are the bits where Carrie Fisher is kind of walking around in this neurotic you know, trance, basically, what do I do? Where do I go? You know, we've got to book you here, got to take you there. Because that, I think, is Nora Ephron's life. This is her life. That's her reality. She's made it in the vein that the Julie Kathner character wants to make. And people ask this question all the time. People ask me about this for the book I wrote on the Coen brothers. You know, how can the Coen brothers make Barton Fink or Inside Lewin Davis about people who are struggling to succeed when they are themselves successful? Is that nostalgia? Is it victory lapping? Is it insecurity? And I'm willing to grant Efron that same complex range of motivations that I would grant the Coens. But this is also a movie where two little girls get on an Amtrak train and run away from their parents, but it's not actually dangerous. You know, or this is a movie where someone says, I'm going to go, go to LA for three weeks. I don't know how it's going to go. And then she goes on every comedy show and kills. It's very gentle. It's very positive. It's very nice. And then that's why the parts that should feel like they belong in our universe, the parts that should feel pulled out of our lives, which is just parents and their kids and the terror of disappointing your kids or the, the, the desire to uh, romanticize your parents, it feels sticky. The performers are miraculously unaffected. Gabby Hoffman is amazing. She's a brilliant child performance. And Samantha Mathis, who's playing a very early 90s idea of a kind of hipster tween or hipster teen. She's very similar to Winona Ryder in Mermaids or some of the John Hughes characters. I mean, it's very similar to that. You know, she sells it. And Julie Kavner is a great actress. I, 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 I love Julie Kavner. But there's a coziness to the repartee. There's a tidiness to it. Even to the fights, they're so, um, they're so written. And so again, when you say, does it take place in our universe? It does, but it takes place in a very cozy corner of our universe because of where Efron was when she made it. And I think if she had written a movie about trying to break in and make it in the seventies, it would have a very different, a very kind of different tone. I don't know. I don't know what people who are at the talk thought when they watched it or what you guys think, but I find that the film is just very, very low stakes. And that's not minimizing what it's about or the seriousness or importance of what it's about, but there's not a lot of risk. And even the tonal inconsistency you're talking about in Ishtar, which is partially a byproduct of how it was edited, it's kind of thrilling. And that does not manifest in, in This Is My Life. Um, I think I'll step in and ask a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, about this is my life. I mean, I think my first sort of response to this um, this refrain that you've been going back to, which is that it's a very gentle movie, um, which I agree, which is probably why I enjoyed watching it because that's what I'm looking for right now uh, in, a, in a not so gentle world. Um, but I, I do think that while the things that might actually have been dangerous in real life, like children going alone on a train without cell phones or anyone knowing where they are, or um, a woman trying to make it in Hollywood and putting herself out there. Um, the danger is the condition of womanhood, right? It's the condition of trying to, trying to find a way to make everyone, including herself, happy. And I mean, I think that's the, the one sort of striking, really striking moment is when she says, you're happy and I'm miserable, or I'm happy and you're miserable. And the sort of conclusion to the film is, we'll, you know, we'll find a way to make it work. We don't, we don't, but the question of how, it, it, it's not answered for us. It's sort of like, okay, they're gonna go hopefully and hand in hand into this future, but is, is it possible for her to be happy and them to be happy at the same time? I don't think we get that sense. It, it almost feels like what they're gonna do is they're gonna kind of trade off who gets to be happy when, um, if she's gonna continue on this, you know, star trajectory. Um, 
but but I want to think about uh, I want to think about this film next to some other films and TV shows, mostly next to the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, sure. um, which is the sort of contemporary counterpart, right? They're both about single moms in New York trying to make it as stand-up comedians. Um, and my question for you is, do you think that, that that TV show, right? So it's a different genre in that way, but do you think that they're saying the same things about women in comedy or are they sending different messages? They're both sort of clean in, in that way, um, in their presentation. Ma I, I wonder if they're saying the same thing. Maisel has the artistic benefit and also the creative crutch of being a period piece. So in its way, much like Mad Men or some other shows, it gets to flatter its audience and score points off the past by saying, say things were bad. Now it's not lying when it says things were bad or things were unequal. It is not at all wrong for calling out a reactionary retrograde period in American history and narrowing it to, again, the difficulties of being a female stand-up comedian and balancing that with home life. I mean, the movie and the show are very simpatico. And I think that uh, Amy Sherman Palladino has talked about Efron's movie, How Can It Not Be an Influence? Because it's incredibly similar. But Maisel can kind of inflate and elevate itself by also being a period piece and by commenting on the past. And we are meant to some extent as viewers to recognize that this is the past and now it is now and now is smarter than them. And it's a very tidy, effective tactic for movies and TV shows to say, it was bad, but you're not like that, or you can recognize that. Now, This Is My Life isn't engaged in the same kind of cultural or social criticism because it's present tense. And so now it's interesting to look at it as a kind of period piece and look at what's different about it. I mean, show business is different. TV is different. Comedy is different. Uh, familial dynamics are different. I mean, you know, you're watching a movie like this and I'm not trying to be cheesy, but it's like, you know, the kids don't have cell phones. I mean, you mentioned that. I mean, in that sense, it's very different. But it's Efron trying to make a statement about her here and now. And I think that Maisel is able to set up the idea of an innovator and a pioneer and a tragic hero. And you can absolutely sketch how high the glass ceiling is. And we know in our heads how and when it's going to be broken. And in a way, the satisfaction of the show is in knowing that whatever's going to happen to the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, we know Amy Sherman Palladino her spiritual inheritor and her creator and her director is going to smash that glass ceiling wide open and win Emmys and win awards because she's funny. So the show is like setting up its own conditions of being, you know, there, but for, you know, it's because of people like this, that people like us can make shows like this. That's not the only way to read that show, but that's where the historical perspective comes in. And that's where I think it is doing something kind of different. I think the themes and the ideas and the contradictions and the difficulties that you're describing are the same in both show and movie. And when I say that I find the movie tidy or cozy or low stakes, it's not because I think the things themselves are low stakes. But when you talk about that ending being sort of uncertain, I would agree with you, except the visual and tonal language of the movie says it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the scene in the film that's very striking is when Efron puts her camera at the corner of the hallway and you see them all kind of retreating into separate rooms behind closed doors and Julie Kavner's on the bed with her head in her hands and Samantha Mathis closes the door and even Gabby Hoffman kind of goes and runs into her room and they're a family divided. And that's a very striking, nice little bit of visual direction. It's actually very sophisticated. Then at the end of the movie, they're all back in the same frame and they're hugging and held together. So while I think technically you're <clears throat> right, we don't know what's gonna happen. I mean, we do know what's gonna happen. They're, they're going to be fine. And Carly Simon will come in on the end credits and remind us that we're going to be fine because Carly Simon is part of that little incestuous cabal with Efron and Carrie Fisher. They all, they're all pals, right? It, it, it kind of, it kind of softens itself. It kind of safety nets itself. And that may be why, even as compared to a movie like Working Girl, which it's not exactly like, but not hugely dissimilar. And they both have the Carly Simon soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, Working Girl has an inspirational ending as well. But in Working Girl, this idea of how do you have it all? How do you balance personal? And she doesn't have a family yet, but like that movie's vicious. You know, that movie suggests that the corporate world is vicious and the world of economics is vicious and that there's bad, mean, venal people, which are Mike Nichols' specialty for whatever reason. You know, uh, It's My Life won't go there. Doesn't mean that what it has to say isn't interesting, but it, 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 
absents itself from saying that. But the scene you're talking about where Kavner says, I'm happy or they're miserable or you know, they're happy and I'm miserable is a very powerful line. And I think that if the movie was committed a little more to showing what that misery might look like instead of setting it up to resolve it instantly, it might be a film that, that, that feels a bit more lasting. Yeah, I like that. And I, I think there's also, there's a certain kind of risk and a danger in trying to prove to your viewer that the people that you're watching are funny yeah. instead of just letting them be funny which I think is a trap that Mrs. Maisel falls in because I don't find her stand-up to be particularly funny. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I'm supposed to find uh, Dottie's stand-up funny. I actually, I said to Aton earlier, I think she's much funnier when she's just talking to her daughters than when she's on the stage trying to be funny. Although she's always trying to be funny. Um, but I, I want, on that note, I want to think of other um, things that we can set this movie next to that are more from its own period. So we can think about her dotty next to other fictionalized men like Larry Sanders, yep. which I think that show was on around the same time. Certainly Seinfeld that started in 89. Um, and th neither of those shows has a real dramatic component. So they're not trying to prove that the guys are funny. The guys just get to be funny and then yep. also have sex. Um, I, I think we might also think about it next to Mr. Saturday Night, the Billy Crystal movie, which came out the same year. Um, and I think my big question about it is, what, how are these men's stories different from Dottie's? Um, but really, what, how do we explain or understand this trend in telling stories about the private lives of comedians? Um, this seems to be, or dramatizing comedy in that way. Well, Mr. Saturday Night has the identical scene where his daughter, says, why are you telling jokes about me? Or why are you telling jokes about our mother? Except in Mr. Saturday Night, they're really nasty jokes. He's like, you know, my daughter's an idiot and you know, her mom's a bitch. I mean, that's, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what it is. And Mr. Saturday Night, the one interesting thing about it is it's a very brazen attempt by Billy Crystal to not be adorable or to sort of suggest that there's a dark side to the adorability. You know, you watch When Harry Met Sally and he's completely Teflon, there's no tension to that character. Billy Crystal's whole thing is to be this cute, obsequious Hollywood suck up and host the Oscars, and I'm just kidding. And Mr. Saturday Night, which he made, and is very much, this is my life, but Billy Crystal's version of it, his self allegory, I think you're great. it's a great comparison. Uh, it lets itself be nastier. In fact, the most famous line in that movie is where David Pamer as his brother says, yeah, I grant you this, 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 and this, you had a hard time, you're brilliant, but you could have been nicer right? The line in Mr. Saturday Night is, you could have been nicer. This is my life is a movie that couldn't be nicer. You know, it's, it, 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 it's trying to be nice. But I mean, mentioning Jerry Seinfeld and, and Larry Sanders makes sense because Larry Sanders was praised for its realism. It was praised for being a kind of behind the scenes documentary. And in good and bad ways, it feels that way because I find Gary Shandling to be a complete charisma vacuum, sort of horrible, unfunny person. It's a great show to me, kind of in spite of him. And Seinfeld is a great show in spite of Jerry Seinfeld. And it's a great show about nothing in spite of the fact that it really truly is about nothing. Like, I don't mean in a satirical existential way. I mean, Jerry Seinfeld is a void. He is a void of feeling. He is a void of humanity and his comedy has aged horrendously. And now when you see him on talk shows, he has nothing to say and the things that he does have to say are fairly gross, I think. I think that he's, he feels very passed by I think by by time and I think that parts of Seinfeld are timeless because the other actors are so funny I mean Julie Louis-Dreyfus and Jason Alexander and Michael Richards these are some of the greatest performances ever on TV that's in spite of Jerry Seinfeld and Seinfeld has nothing to say about comedy and it certainly has nothing to say about the relationship between comedy and private life because he doesn't care about anything that's where Mr. Saturday Night and This Is My Life feel somewhat similar in that they are about the risks that come with being funny and that the hostility that underpins being funny can alienate the people you love. Seinfeld solves that problem by there being nobody that he loves and nobody actually loves right. him. So Seinfeld sure. is, is no hugging, no learning. And I no think hugging. this is my life is all hugging and learning. Yeah, it's all, all hugging and learning. And, you know, Larry Sanders is also kind of no hugging, no learning, but it's also about the absolute insecurity and the pitiless need of people who kind of live in the spotlight. Because the whole point of that show is that he's a success. So Larry Sanders can imagine himself and fictionalize himself as a success. And Nora Ephron is still 
in spite of having written Heartburn and When Harry Met Sally, she's still fictionalizing and allegorizing herself as someone who's trying. And in some ways that's kind of uh, very empathetic and very, and, and, and very likable. I, I think the comparison you made to Mr. Saturday Night is so smart. I wish I'd thought of that before sitting down. I would have worked it in, but you brought it here anyway, because those two movies side by side make a lot of sense. I want to get to a question from the chat, and we're coming up on time. So if anyone has any yeah, final questions, one. please write them down. Um, this one says, we know that the CIA, in fact, did support lots of art and culture during the Cold War. Was this an intentional part of May's satire? Um, I mean, I can't speak for her, but I think that there's definitely a parallel that's being drawn, not just between the real world malfeasance of the CIA in the Middle East, but also the idea of the CIA kind of as producers, <laughs> as money men and movie producers and people who are kind of staging fictitious events. I mean, it's the same kind of idea in Wag the Dog, which casts Dustin Hoffman as an actual movie producer who's brought in to produce a a war in David Mamet's bizarrely right-wing version of political satire, his Clinton era assassination, character assassination piece. But yeah, I mean, I think Elaine May is always skeptical about power. I don't think any of her other movies are as explicitly political as Ishtar is, but the CIA in this movie is obviously not just representing her view of the CIA in the period. I mean, they're stand-ins for kind of saber-rattling Reagan-ish foreign Diplomacy, which is not to say that the movie transcends stereotypes of the Middle East at all. I mean, in a way, its view of the Middle East and of that culture and of that climate and of the people in it, it, it actually does retrograde date back to Crosby and, and, and Hope. It's not really liberated or progressive kind of past. I mean, one thing about Elaine May generally as a comedian is that she she falls back on a lot of old stuff. She's like an old fashioned kind of joke generator, but that's sort of her, her greatness. And the tension between that old fashioned joke generation and again, some of the just daringly modern ideas about comedy and comedy direction she has are what's, uh, are what's so exciting. I think there's a good there's a good joke in the very beginning of the scene of the movie of they're staring at the Simon and Garfunkel <laughs> and with awe and it's their greatest hits which are now on CD but the posters on the other side are Talking Heads and Bruce Springsteen and you know their aspirations have become so passe and have so far removed and one almost gets the sense when when Charles Grodin is on the phone with all the parties at the end of the movie that his frustration is not the CIA has to make a hit out of this random act that you've never heard of. It's we have to make an act, a hit out of this act yeah. who has such old fashioned, you know, type recordings. But we were, we were talking about this briefly in the preamble before we all got on. And it's a real achievement, I think, in the movie, the particular badness of their music. Like, it's not bad in a way where you're supposed to think actually this is good. And it's not like Spinal Tap, where these are like brilliantly satirical fake rock songs that even though they're bad in the world of the movie, we recognize they're good. I mean, the songs in Ishtar are like truly awful, but they're awful in such a skillful, assured way. And I think the awfulness does seem to belong to the characters. That first scene where they're trying to write the song together that you cited where their bitter herb is a lyric and, you know, they can't quite... I love the idea that dangerous business is a... It's like a big statement. They, they they want to make this satirical statement in their song, but they don't know what it is. So they say, to, you know, but is it telling the truth is dangerous business. And then there's a half second pause and Dustin Hoffman goes, well, why? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, you, you want to say that in a song and you don't know what you're saying. You're just saying it because it fits the meter or it fits the rhyme scheme. I love that scene of them sitting at the piano and trying to write their terrible, their terrible song. Because there's, that's a moment too that I think comes out of Elaine May's own life the difficulty of creating something, even if it's these two schmucks trying to do it. And I find that that scene to me, and again, I'm not trying to compare the movies or have one to beat up on the other, but I find that scene gets more at what it must really be like to try and sit down and do something than the off the top of her head one-liners that Kavner keeps coming up with in This Is My Life, where you feel like, well, one of the reasons she is going to make it as a stand-up comic is because she's being written by Nora Ephron. She feels right. like, get like a mouthpiece for Efron's jokes, as opposed to the jokes really coming from her. But again, that's a bit of a subjective thing that I'm a, a viewer. So. And if I can make a comparison again between the two movies, in Ishtar, it seems to be about the self-delusion 
that you need to have in order to do anything creative. You have to have the delusion that you, your nothing is worthwhile uh, yeah. in order to kind of try and pursue writing these songs and that you can make it big, that Casablanca, this gig in Casablanca can be how you, you know, you, you come to success. Whereas in This Is My Life, it's self-confidence. It's this kind of sense of, yeah. I am funny and funny will lead me to be successful. Um, and that's a real kind of demarcation between the two uh, in terms of its attitude or anything else. But, you know, I wonder also, like, I just made, this is my final question is it was Dustin Hoffman, right? Should the movie have just kind of been set in New York and you have these self deluded, you know, songwriters kind of bumbling around, you no, know, from was, club to club, or do you need the middle East self delusion for the kind of commentary on America and everything else? The reason I'll say no is because she already made Mikey and Nikki. Right. And I think Elaine May is a great enough filmmaker that she can have the movies all be the same in the way that an auteur does without repeating herself. So I think flying to Morocco or to Ishtar and trying to do the Hope Crosby thing while also doing the sort of, uh, you know, uh, thought, Cold War thaw out, you know, comedy or the comedy of middle of regime change and destabilization is completely commensurate with her genius and her ambition. She should have tried to do it. And I, I, re, I resist the idea that Ishtar is a movie that, uh, that doesn't quite work. I think it works extremely well. I just think you can see the bruises and the battering, but I think it kind of pushes through those things. Anyway, I mean, even just in describing it, it's making me kind of wanna watch it again because it also, we didn't really get into this, but it comes out in a decade where everything is formula. You know, the legacy of the 80s, I sort of hinted at this earlier, the legacy of the 80s is a legacy of formula. The idea of high concept is a movie you can describe in a sentence or half a sentence. And that's what all these flashy bad boy John Peters type producers, that's why they say we don't need to read scripts. Because the, the synopsis is the movie. You know, the tagline is the movie. And I think that the ways in which Ishtar is kind of trying to fit into that ecosystem and then can't fit into that ecosystem and then is pushing against that ecosystem makes the movie almost heroic in spite of whether it's good or bad. But then I also think the ways in which it's good are the ways mostly in which it's kind of pushing against that. The tonal whiplash of here's a 20 minute, you know, Elaine Mayish New York comedy. Now all of a sudden we're in the desert. It's exciting. I mean, I can say I, saw, I went and saw Ishtar two years ago now, feels like several lifetimes ago in light of what's happened, but two years ago, TIFF showed it, the Toronto National Film Festival showed it with an introduction by a local critic. And it was amazing to sit in an audience full of people who hadn't seen it and against the pre-sale of it as a bad movie, they weren't laughing at it in a reverent way or like they were trying to laugh at it. They were just laughing because comedy is involuntary. And it was so pleasurable to see people sitting in Ishtar and laughing with it or laughing with it at the characters kind of within it, not as a special excursion, not as a pedagogical experiment, not as, hey, let's see what this thing's like. They're just kind of enjoying it as a comedy. It's a very nice movie going memory for me. I think that's a beautiful memory and a, pl a great place for us to yeah, end sure. this. So I want to thank you so much again, Adam Neiman That's and Eitan, and of course the Toby Center for Jewish Studies. And I'm going to stop the recording now. Thanks to everyone for attending.